And after five years, we reached six million in revenues. And he said, this is called a studio. And actually, I was not aware it was called a studio. Well, I interviewed over 70 studio founders. Uh, I want to understand what happened during the three years that you were able to convince your LPs. Yeah, very demanding. One of our startups has already raised over 2.5 million. The equity price per point must be lower than the market. It takes us four months to get to an operative test of the startups that we want to launch. So usually we start with like 40, 50 ideas per year. They yeah, our how, startups how? have to go international. We usually use Italy as a pilot. You're the CEO and mm. you are the co-founder. You decide how much salary you mm. want to give yourself. Max Pog builds a startup studio. Hi, my name is Max, I'm an entrepreneur and I decided to build startup studios. And in order to make a high probability of exits, high return to investors, unicorns, I decided to invite startup studio founders, venture studio founders, venture builder founders and uh, VC fund managers, general partners to discuss all VC-related topics, to understand how to build companies in a more efficient way. Today my guest is Farhat Alessandro Mohammadi, a founder and CEO of Mamazen, a startup studio based in Turin, Italy. Farhat also is a, an author of Startup Studio Manifesto book. I read it. It is fantastic and I recommend you to buy it on Amazon and read and understand all truth about Startup Studios. Uh, we discussed the model, the founder model of studio when they build companies from scratch and then after validation then attract co-founders to these companies. A studio takes 30% equity stake and the rest is studio. Uh, co-founders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, CTOs or product managers. So I believe this interview has a lot of useful insights how not to make mistakes during creating a startup studio. So if you want to get more useful content on Venture Studios, please subscribe plus under this video on LinkedIn, on YouTube and we will create more interesting interviews. Hi Farhot, I'm very uh, grateful that you joined my podcast about Startup Studios. And uh, can you say several yes. uh, words about your book? So you recently yeah. published a book already like yeah. two months ago. How is it to be an author of the book? <laughs> well, well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, um, and I'm really, really happy to be here. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it, it was kind of quite of an effort coming up with this book. It, it took us pretty much one year, one year and a half to craft it. Well, I'm happy Startup Studio Manifesto, you know, is, is there, is on Amazon. It goes on the surface, but it helps who does not know the topic to understand a little bit more about Startup Studios and why they're becoming so valuable asset class right now and what is happening and I mean, how they are formed, what kind of startup studios exist, and so on. Can you share your path, uh, like how you came to create a startup studio, Mamazen? When when uh, did it start? In in what yeah. year? The path the path was pretty much, I mean, a long path. It's it's a long time that I'm working in startups. I worked as a manager in two scale up. Bakeka.it, that was pretty much a copycat of Craigslist. And then I worked in Glamour.com and we exited Glamour.com to the Italian Yellow Pages. 
after that, just um, and uh, after that, I founded my own startup. And after five years, we reached six million in revenues, and there was a projection of ten million in the next in, in the next year. But we managed to sell to sell the startup to to a bigger company. We received free offers, and we sold it. Uh, well, after that, yeah, I in July two thousand and eighteen, we sold the company, and on September two thousand and eighteen, I was already working on the studio model and um, but i initiated my research way 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 before i mean it was like in 2017 because we we were already signed you know uh in a, an agreement to sell a company so i was already working on on the next on the next thing and so i started to interview a lot of studios i and actually i was not aware it was called a studio uh, it, mm -hmm. it was it was an idea that came to my mind. I want to be the co-founder of many startups. I want to work in parallel and so on. And suddenly, I remember that one one of my friends came back from UK and uh, and I and he said, "Okay, now that you're going to sell, you already signed the pre you know the pre agreement. What are you going to do?" And I said, "Well, I'm going to work on this." Uh, I don't know still how to craft it on, but it's, it's going to be something like that. So I want to create more than one company per year. And he said, this is called a studio. So what's a studio? And mm -hmm. then I started to discover, uh, discover how they were working and do inquiries on many different models. I interviewed over 70 studio founders. Wow, and, great. And then we started. So we founded the studio in the late 2018. And uh, yeah, that's it. And then uh, you launched a fund also, IH1. Yeah. So was it simul simultaneously with the studio or it was after you started work as a studio? We uh, founded and funded the studio by ourselves. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, my partner and I, Alessandro Mina and I. And after that, we uh, decided to put, put some money in and create, let's say, the first free startups and before going for external funding. And when we arrived, a certain point was the late, late 2021. I spoke uh, again with some studio founders regarding how to conduct a fundraising for a studio. And there were many models, the single fund model, the operating companies, the dual entity, and then many, many others. <laughs> and then I suddenly met Tom Durr from Science, one of the best studio in the world, and it's 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 among the best studio in the world, definitely. You know, Science, Idea Lab, Atomic, and so on. He taught me how to do it, and he explained me that the dual entity was the best model to follow. In what year? So it was like in one year after create after creation a studio, or after two years. You, well, uh, you decided. It was, it was the end of 2021. So we created the studio in the end of 2018. So uh -huh. three years. 19, 20, three years. Yeah, we decided, you know, to to proceed. You know, we are entrepreneurs. We love bootstrapping. So we decided to invest our own money before going on and um, raise money from others. Uh, and uh, am I right that during these three years, uh, you were able to show to your future potential limited partners and investors that, uh, look, we put like, I don't know, $1 million or uh, euros uh, for this. <laughs> yeah. And and then now it is valued at like, I don't know, 10 million euros. So yeah, no, we showed, we showed our track record. We showed the startups that we've built. And uh, and so it was. It was easy, you know. It's never easy, but when you can show a track record, when you can show that you built something before asking other people's money, it's easier to go and raise. And in fact, usually, uh, the dual entity model is not something that it's uh, suggested to as a financing model at the very beginning. 
So at the very beginning, you need a track record. You need to show that you're able to build before go out there and raise some money. Like uh, I want to understand what happened during the three years that you were able to convince your LPs yeah. that a studio model works and uh, the three years shows it. Well, we built three startups. One of our startups has already raised over 2.5 million um, debt. Maybe compared to US is, is not that much, but in, in Italy, it's it's quite an amount of money. And the, the second startup already raised money. The first startup was was already break even after two years. So we had we had a good track record in terms of the companies that we built. They all raised money. All of the companies that we built raised money, which is something that you expect from a studio. 84% of the startup from a studio go to a seed round and we had 100%, so it was good. And one of our startup was already going, uh, already went through through around day because in Italy usually around day it's approximately one one point five two million something like this. It was good in terms of results at the, at the very beginning, and also in mm -hmm. terms of time, you know, mm -hmm, the time that mm -hmm. has passed before before gaining those results. what is important for potential investors in studios. So for example, TVPI, that like we started with this capital and now our equity is valued at uh, market terms on this. And we we, are like, we already have multiple, like five or yeah. 10 or something well, like this. This is definitely, definitely one of, one of the metrics that counts, uh, especially if you, if you run a dual entity or if you run a single fund, right? Because you have to confront with other funds and, and you must, win it and but besides that i think that considering a studio you have to have a playbook in place you have to show that you have a repeatable process for building companies and for taking them i don't know from zero to product market fit you have to have a repeatable process Let's say that you are a founder studio because there's usually, I love the definition from Sarah Anderson. She calls studios company creation funds. And she usually distinguish between, you know, either you are a founder studio or you are a co-founder studio. Okay, so we are a founder studio. So we create companies, then we look for co-founders. And you need to have, the right process in place to attract founders and you have to show that you're able to attract founders. If I was looking at things as an investor, I want to see that people that are running that studio have previous entrepreneurial experience, successful, of course, they need to have exits. They must uh, have a process in place and I would be very, very demanding the process must be challenged. Then I want to see the equity split between founders and the studio because if you have too much equity, then these startups are not VC ready. Let's say that these startups are not VC ready because you're taking too much equity or, I mean, more equity than VC expect. Then as a studio, it's okay. It's okay as an investor, but I can say, hey, show me that you have a different path to funding or a different path for growing these startups because you cannot go to a C. The process must be in place. Mm -hmm. And of course, the equity that you take, you should be able as a studio to pay the price of the equity, the equity price per point must be lower than the market. Otherwise, why I need to be in the early stage, you know, take so much risk if I don't pay a lower price compared to the market. And if I don't own a bigger chunk of equity. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. these these things I think mm -hmm. are very important considering mm -hmm. when considering investing into a studio. So the the experience of the team, how much equity they own, the price per equity point, and uh, yeah, the process, the repeatable process. If they don't have a repeatable process, and also the vertical where they're working. So how much economy of scale they can build from their their startups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and the kind of founder that they select, of course. 
Uh-huh. It's interesting you say that you are a founder studio, which means that you start them from scratch without entrepreneurs, build them uh, until the specific point where yeah. you understand that it works already, probably found product market fit, and then uh, attract uh, co-founders. I understand why a co-founder model works well when you take equity like, I don't know, 33%, 25% or something like this and attract two or three co-founders from from scratch uh, and you do this process together and entrepreneurs already understand how this idea works. So they love this idea and they continue to grow it. Uh, and uh, these companies can raise future rounds because the uh, studio hasn't like majority of equity. Exactly. Uh, can you elaborate on uh, f- the founder model? So what is usually how much equity co-founders get after you attract them? What kind uh, of co-founders? And do you have problems with this transferring that we already built some company and we are transferring it to, to new yeah. people? So, so can you explain this well, process? Yeah, well, usually our studio hold 30%. And the, fa- the co-founders get 70% of the equity, so they get a lot. So we give them the majority, we give them a high majority. And by doing this, the company is VC ready. So they are able to raise from VC. This is good because it's, it's uh, I mean, in a normal path for startup, it's, it's, it's something that, it, that will happen, that should happen at least, right? Uh, this is the amount of equity that we own. Yeah. Could be a problem, you know, when you transfer something that there could be, you know, it's it's exactly, but it's something that it's exactly when a startup founder looks for a co-founder. It happens all the time out there because it's, you know, when people look at a company, at a studio, an institutional founder, usually, you know, it's strange because say, oh no, but uh, are the co-founders engaged? Yeah. As much as a co-founder of a startup is engaged, yes, they are engaged. I usually say, hey, do you want to come and tell me that the co-founder of Airbnb is not the real founder? So no, of course, no. You know, there's always a co-founder and usually a co-founder is someone who joins a little bit later, usually, usually. Not always, but it happens. Uh, Another thing that I always say, and well, Data is baking it because a lot of studios are doing this successfully. Actually, a lot of studios are doing this with a higher success rate compared to traditional startups. So the process works. So it's the process is baked by data. The process is baked by it's what is already happening to startups out there. And also, you know, if you are a natural parent, parent, let's say you have a baby, do you want me to believe that someone who adopts a baby don't love that baby as much as you love your baby? Or do you want to tell me that the natural parents is better than a parents that it's adopting? Because I don't get, I, I don't buy it. What amount, what period of time usually takes uh, to you to decide to attract co-founder? And what is this stage? Like, uh, does the company um, have revenue? Okay, so we usually, uh, okay, our path works like this. So it takes us four months to get to um, an operative test of the startups that we want to launch. So usually we start with like 40, 50 ideas per year. Actually not ideas, but we look for problem to solve out there. Mm -hmm. So we analyze Google trends, we analyze market trends, we analyze market dimension problems, reports, a lot of things. And we come out with 50 problems to solve. And then we we have a process, of course, a validation process, and we go from this 50, to 25, 10, and then later on uh, to two or three startups to launch. And then we start the operative tests. And 
that it will take us a little bit between like one to two, three months. And when we start to do the operative tests, we are already looking for founders, co-founders to join us <clears throat> because we have something to show. And usually when we start the operative tests, we know we will get revenue. So usually when we start to work with co-founders, we already have a company that is making revenues and has early adopters. And we have a basic, and by basic, I mean basic MVP, which is mm -hmm. usually something built with forms, I don't know, Tally or Typeform, Google Sheet, and this kind of thing. And later on, when the company becomes autonomous, when startups, when the startup become autonomous, then usually we have two founders, a team member, let's say, and we have an MVP built with no code tools such as Bubble.io in place, revenues, and a proper product market fit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the whole process is like twelve months. So usually it takes. Uh, am I right that it takes twelve months to onboard founders from? No, from it's, ID? it's uh, we have four months of uh, ideation and validation, uh -huh. Uh -huh. then three months to onboard founders approximately. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it's seven months. And then we have five months more, six months more of studio support. So the studio mm -hmm. team will be the operative team of the startup for mm -hmm. six months mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before they start to recruit and go to through a seed round. And we will give them at, at the very start a pre-seed to arrange Mm -hmm. everything they need because they, they already have the studio team, they already have our legal team, they already have our press office, they already have our marketing people, they already have everything and they have the founders but we still give them 100k to, you know, for operational costs and so on and then they have to go through the seat, seat round mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we will be with them until the seat round. Uh -huh. And we usually have a forced right of refusal also in the seed round to put some more money with the, mm -hmm. with the fund. So the fund will put some money uh, at the very start and then some money in the seed round. Usually it's mm -hmm. 100K and then 250K later on. And mm -hmm. we will uh, do some follow-ups in case of really outstanding startups what revenue usually is by the seed stage is there some benchmarks that for example you have to have like well, 30k we MR? want to yeah let's say we want to reach the seed round by having at least 15 20k mrr mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and in, it's interesting in the founder model of a studio that your value is uh, maybe a bit a big uh, a bit bigger than in co-founder mo mode because like when you attract co-founders in the starting point you are not sure that this idea will be validated and it will have a product market fit but uh, but as you attract co-founders already for validated ideas so it's a bit more chances to success uh, do, you, do you think and feel that it is helping you to attract better co-founders? Yeah. I, I think so. I think so. I really do not. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of the co-founder model uh, because um, you, you know, even if you attract good founders, usually they're in love with their idea and they want to go quick on the validation they might want to validate their idea rather than invalidate their idea. Mm. So instead, when we do our validation process that we actually call invalidation, mm. so we are looking to, you know, to kill as much idea as we can. So once we get to that point, those are the best ideas that we can come up with so in this case you attract the perfect founder for that idea and you know you give them a lot of value because usually it takes like almost two years to go, to get to that point 
And in this way, by with the founder model, you have a better process in terms of timeline because you do your own thing, then you go out there, look for founders, and instead, you know, in the co-founder model, maybe good founder join now, and I'm already in the middle of launching a startup, so I have to defocus, go on that one, because I don't want to lose those founder. So it's, for me, it's not a rule, but I think it's better. Uh, and can you share some insights from attracting co-founders? Like, do you, do you work only with entrepreneurs, who had already experience in building companies, or sometimes you take top management from big IT companies or, or something like that. So what is the top, profile? Yeah, top management for big IT companies really doesn't work. I mean, we try to hire people from big corporates. It doesn't work. And uh, so mainly we are looking for entrepreneurs. So people that have already been there. So, of course, the best, the ideal profile is that you've been there, you went from zero to exit with a successful exit, and you're ready to start again. Or mm -hmm. you've been there, you raised some money, not on crowdfunding, you raised some money from private investor, then, I mean, I don't know, you reached a certain amount of revenues, and then you fail for whatever reason, okay, but you've been there. So you went from zero to scaling and then you failed, it's okay, but you've been there. Mm -hmm. Or you worked as an early hire in a startup that became a scale-up and you were in a management role. And uh, you build a business unit into 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 a scale up. You work as a consultant in a big four, but this is not the most desirable. Let's say that we someone that was working in a big four can work with someone who's an entrepreneur or has worked in a scale up. It's better to you know to have a mix. You know, mm -hmm. I, I would not take just someone that has worked in a big four and put it on a startup without no one else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that bootstrap business experience is helpful in, in uh, uh, starting? Yeah. Like in being CEO? Yeah, definitely. You know, if you have experience in bootstrapping or let's say that you've been a growth hacker in a startup or in a scale-up. Love it. Product mm -hmm. manager in a startup or in a scale-up. I mean, the better is that mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm, a startup, mm -hmm. you raised mm -hmm. some money, you became a scale-up, and you mm -hmm. were there from day one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you have to be able to manage a team as well. Uh, in case of the CEO, we want to have people that has already raised money so they know how to approach a VC term sheet. Mm -hmm. They know what liquidation preference is. Drag along, tag along, I don't know. Uh, narrow-based uh, uh, anti-dilution or, uh, um, I don't know, uh, anyway, you know, all of the things that you need to know in a standard term sheet when you're going to raise some money, voting rights and other things. How you convince or persuade uh, those, uh, like, really high experienced entrepreneurs do you think it is it is uh, possible to attract someone with exits and do you have like one example uh, yeah we have we have one we have one uh -huh. with a small exit that we did we attracted you know and uh, usually people know that they've struggled a lot so they recognize the value of a validated product and the value of working with experienced people let's say that they already work with a very good team and so they are not they already have a team and they I mean they are all they already made some work during the validation so it was not maybe their first startup was the second one and so they are on the third that kind of uh, people are maybe a little bit uh, harder to attract because maybe they already have something in place. I mean, they have the team, they have the 
the, the investors and so on. They have their legal team. So they already have a lot of things. So they're already building their economy at scale. Okay. But still, if you have a good, I don't know, let's say that you become, that your studio, I don't know, it's out there from like six, seven, eight years, and you have a lot of expertise in that industry, and they are just jumping into that industry, they might want to join you. So it really depends on how much value you can offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, I do have an experienced entrepreneur that joined our startup. And it's hard to track. Yeah, I mean, they they ask a lot of questions. I mean, it's not like first time founders, so they ask a lot of questions. Our term sheet uh, is always being carefully reviewed by their their lawyers. They usually wants to learn a lot about what you're doing, about the value you're adding. Um, so it's 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 challenging. But these kind of people, they, they are the right people that you need to do the work. So you have to have fair terms. Otherwise, you cannot mm -hmm. attract them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, Almost. you attract, you know, not first year, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and what is your uh, salary in the, from, from the first day? Or you have some KPIs that let's let's raise round and then you'll, you'll have... A great salary now it is yeah. like 50 well, percent we something don't like we don't we don't uh, push that much on the salary we give them you know this fourth pre-seed at the very beginning and says uh -huh. okay you're the ceo and mm -hmm. you are the co-founder you decide how much salary you mm -hmm. want to give yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and usually they decide for a fair salary because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they know and they mm -hmm. know that they will raise it later on when they raise rounds and when the startup is, is delivering results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but we don't, you know, we don't give them guidelines. I mean, mm -hmm. we expect to have people that build their own guidelines. Can you share what, what startups do you build? How many startups you built for this uh, like almost five years. Yeah, we we built five. We uh -huh. built five. every year. Every year, one one one. Company. Yeah, appro approximately. This year we built two. On the next year we will build three. So mm. what we want to do is to reach fifteen startups at the end. Mm -hmm. At the end, you mean that you have some time for the yeah. fund? Yeah, to... and for the studio. So our studio. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, uh, it has an expiry date. We will build the new studio because the fund is financing this batch of startups. And then the new studio uh, will be the good thing also to have, a, you know, a studio with an expiring date is that, let's say we meet a lot of good people so we can attract more talents and after five years we can maybe have new founders in the studio and having a stronger team or our team member right now can become founders as well and so in this case we have a stronger team and we can i mean deliver better startups and also raise more money, build more verticals. I don't know. So it's it's good. Mm -hmm. um, and you you build startups uh, first for Italy market, or you it, you plan that these startups are internationally from day yeah, one? Yeah, our how, startups how? have to go international. We usually use Italy as a pilot. Morsi will be will go international. But uh, it, it took us a little bit long, of course, to, to learn, to learn the process and so on, and to learn startup at the same time and raise money at the same time. So it's, yeah, it, it takes a little bit longer if you want to put everything in the, in the right place when you're building a studio. So mm -hmm, I definitely mm -hmm. suggest, you know, a studio to build the four startups and to take very 
good notes of everything they do in the process. Because at the very beginning, you know, we, we were confronting this as entrepreneurs. Let's let's talk about the biggest mistakes. Like what what have you learned during the period? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> well, not to try to do two things at once, and you will say, well, that's obvious, Farhan. You know, but we found since we, a lot of corporates were asking us to do corporate venture building, we thought that we can make two things at once. Mm, corporate and yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, and. Uh, and then uh, we decided to um, uh, not to pursue that that uh, that path because um, it's you know you can you can either concentrate on venture building, pure venture building, or on corporate venture building. Then later on, maybe when we will be mature enough to start another team. And to make it focus on corporate venture building, maybe we will do it. But you cannot have one team that is trying to do corporate venture building and venture building at the same time. Well, I know that it sounds obvious, but it was not obvious for us at the very beginning. And also, we tried to build more than one startup the first year. And then also, we were thinking to attract, I know, younger founders then we found out that it was not the right path to follow. I also wrote, wrote an article on, uh, I think it's only in Italian, but, but I would want to translate it because it's, I mean, it, it's, it's good for other people to learn on all the mistakes that we made during oh, wow, building great. Amazon. <laughs> what is the reason or what are reasons why studios fail like uh focus might be uh yeah focus what do you think lack of focus on the portfolio you set up a studio and you try to do more than one thing so venture building co-founding founding acceleration well, a little bit of investments and so on. So focus of the studio, but you have to achieve as much um, of capital efficiency that you can. So if you focus, we focus on a specific target of customers and we have our privacy, um, it's, it's uh, shared between startups and studio and between the studio. So once you have the same customers that buy pretty much the same thing, mm -hmm. your customer acquisition costs will go lower, will be lower. And that's important. And another thing, since we are pretty much working always on the same business model, which is marketplaces for small companies and this kind of thing that they have, so B2B2C, for super small companies or self-employed. So also, and usually on home services, so services that you can take it at, uh, at the doorstep. So in this case, we have similarity in the software that we built. So we can reuse the assets. Besides that, we can reuse the marketing techniques. The revenue models is always the same. So we can attract uh, also the same kind of talents in the founders. So this is something that you must achieve in a studio, especially at the very beginning, because otherwise it's, it's, really, it's really hard. And um, another thing that I think it's, you know, a reason for failure. It's it's the team of the studio. I've seen many studios that they don't have enough experience and they start a studio. And they'll raise maybe a little bit of money. But, you know, my family and friends and Alessandro Mina, my co-founder, family and friends, it's a bigger family and friends because we already had an exit. So it's easier to attract money. So even if you're good, if you even if you're learning things quickly, but you not ha don't have enough experience and track record, it's hard to raise. 
Mm-hmm. And another reason for failure is sometimes taking too much equity. So the equity splits. Or the studio. Uh, I've seen a lot of models in where studios um, make revenues from their startups, a lot of revenues. So startups are obli- uh, are um, forced to buy services from the studio. So in this case, the studio has not an alignment of interest with the startups. Or let's say that the studio has um, preferred stocks and the founders have common stocks. So the studio and the founders must own common stock. The fund can have preferred Mm -hmm. stock, but Mm -hmm. not the studio. Mm -hmm. So for Mm -hmm. me, you know, studio having preferred stocks over their founders, it's a red flag. Too much equity if they have to go through a VC funding, it's a red flag. If they don't have focus and they do, I don't know, corporate venture building, venture building acceleration, co-founding and funding, it's a red flag. And uh, if they don't have, yeah, I mean, if they don't set up a proper playbook, validation process, it's not going to work. You know, a lot of maybe, you know, just charging some equity from an idea stage, it's 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 not being a studio. It's not a venture building model. It's just people building some random shit. It's you don't, you're not making an economy of scale. You're not, um, you're not working on efficiency. Studio is all about capital efficiency. If you're not working on that. Of course, studio capitalization. So if you don't have enough money to build, again, mm-hmm, but this mm-hmm. depends on the track record on the founders mm-hmm. and the studio structure, studio finance structure. So I don't believe in a single fund because, you know, a studio may, uh, founder must be involved and, uh, I mean, Usually, uh, VCs wants the founder of a startup to be committed, and they have to have the majority to be committed. But if you are a studio founder, also if you have a big fund, you have 100 million fund, right? And so your management fee is pretty pretty big. But even in and so you're able to cover all the studio operation with this. But still, you own 20 percent. Because that's your carried. And there is a harder rate as well. So you're not paid as a founder, you're paid as a manager, but you don't have just to select investments. You have to do things, mm-hmm. to craft mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. So I don't hear I don't think that there is enough level of commitment to deliver. You know, I will only take twenty percent of what I built. No, mm-hmm. I want mm-hmm. more. So the dual entity model works better in this case. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, single fund model is usually just uh, VC funds which already invest uh, in other startups and they and they decide, oh, maybe we will uh, build some startups uh, inside inside. So I think that. I'm not sure it is uh, like some studios decide that, oh, let's let's create a studio and we'll start a fund and we'll live on this management fee and then have some equity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there are some single fund studio out there, but I think that, uh, I don't know exactly if they build or not. I think they are just operational VCs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. And, but... Yeah, I do, I do not believe that it's a structure that works. An operating company also is hard to make it work because you have to raise either to raise a lot of money up front or if you don't raise a lot of money up front, then you have to raise again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And then you have to stop your operation to raise. So again, it's it's not working. I want to understand a bit uh, in your case, like you have a fund and it pays costs of the studio, probably. Yeah, exactly. The and uh, invests into the studio. Uh huh. And also, it invests like 100k uh, on pre-seed, and then uh, also participates in seed round. 
Yeah, exactly. And, uh, does it get preferred stocks uh, during seed or pre-seed? Yeah. Or it is... Uh -huh. No, okay. Yeah. So the, the fun invest into the studio. Uh -huh. So, and by, by at the end of all the investment into the studio, the fund will hold 35% of the studio. Mm -hmm. Since the studio hold 30% of each startups, it means that the fund have 10.5% of each and every startups built by the studio through indirect equity. You know, there is a pass through. Does it get also, uh, like when it invests in on seed, does a fund uh, get additional shares? Yeah, when the when the fund invests in seed and pre-seed, they get they get shares for their investments, and they get preferred stocks in that case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So only in that in that case, we have a non-participating liquidation preference one per. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we we need also the uh, <clears throat> uh, our terms and condition of the fund to be fair if we want to raise more money. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, and, and so it owns equity on the studio, so indirect equity in, in each startup, and uh, of course has a liquidation preference over the studio. So the studio must return everything the fund has invested into the studio before getting money from the exits. So these align the interests of studio founders and the fund. And uh, of course, the studio has, in this way, cover operational costs. And then, um, <clears throat> uh, with these operational costs, um, the studio um, doesn't have too much money you know, to take and put in every startups and, how, and so there's not a conflict of interest because that is demanded to the fund. Then the fund can invest into startups but you know, fund managers are paid with a performance fee, so they must invest in the right startups because otherwise they don't get their carried. So in this way, you align interests between studio founders and the fund and between fund managers and the LPs. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> these teams are separate? Or yeah. you have... Uh -huh. Yeah, well, uh, the, studio, the, the, fund, the studio fund, it's operated by uh, studio founders but not by the studio. So studio founders are, have interest in investing the money properly because otherwise they don't get their carried. And usually the management fees are super small on a studio fund. In the book, you mentioned that uh, like startups from studios, they uh, have an average exit of 74 million in comparison with 50 million. Yeah dollars yeah. to usual usual or convenient startups conventional uh, and uh, uh, 16 percent in comparison with eight percent exit so i want to understand what is the source of data so you yeah. did your own research or yeah yeah what, what did, did you use yeah we used we used some papers i mean we uh, participated in a research uh, done by studio hub on 70 studios uh -huh. And if I remember well, but anyway, there, it was a significant, statistically mm -hmm. significant amount of studio. And there is another research um, from GSN, Disrupting the Venture Landscape. And I mean, there, there were many, uh, more than one research that we, that we used in that book. Of course, you know, the data on the studio are not that public at the moment. So there's more things to, to mm -hmm. go through. But mm -hmm. uh, we, we do believe that it will become public later on. I think that there is a big, um, big effort in this right now. There's a lot of people working toward this goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, also... Uh, like, can you share if uh, if you if you have some numbers of I don't know your IRRs if they are just on paper yet? Uh, like uh, for for this startup, so do you understand like what multiple you get on uh, 
initial invest investments uh, building startups? Well, uh, we didn't publish our data, and uh, but we will. But we will definitely, I think, by the end of 2024, because we want to publish. I mean, we are not a public company, so we don't have to publish it. But um, we are trying to do, uh, you know, um, an effort in transparency. So I think that we will. I don't mm -hmm. want to promise, but I think that mm -hmm. we will. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's going okay. well. Uh huh. Yeah, great. <laughs> uh, one more question about co-founders. So yeah. you attract usually two co-founders, or it depends. Two two co-founders. One is CEO and one is CTO, or other. Yeah, it it really depends. Yeah, one has to be the CEO, of course, and is is the one that usually holds more equity, a little in 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 the equity stake, and then we usually look for a CDO or better a product product guy, pro product girl, I mean, mm -hmm, uh, product mm -hmm. person, product person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the kind of people. So usually we want to have someone that is able to raise money, to speak with people, to, you know, um, be more a public person. And the, the other one should be a product person. Thank you, Farhad. Thank uh, you. I want to ask you to give final word of piece of advice for aspiring studio founders. So if you were uh, to start this from scratch, like what, what could you advise <laughs> uh, yourself? <laughs> well, you know, well, of course, you know, you have to uh, have experience, so be careful. Don't rush, <clears throat> don't rush a studio. It's something that you build after you gone through a lot and yeah, build one startup the next, the, the first year and fix it and make it work and be careful to build a process before going to the second one. Max Pog builds a startup studio.